you know, hepatitis B is really an area that I'm very passionate about. I see a lot of patients with hepatitis B, and it's dear to my heart. I'd like to basically share my experience and hope that this will be a good educational experience for all of you who come. Um, so, you know, why, you know, what, what's the, um, the, the key issues that we would like to address here? So I'd like to divide, you know, this into these parts. So first of all, you know, you know, many of us don't have hepatitis B, but who should be tested for hepatitis B? So who are at risk and uh, why should we do screening or testing for hepatitis B? And uh, for us physicians and patients, we do test, and you need to know why are we doing the test, uh, what do they mean. You know, liver test, hepatitis B test, those are really complicated. Even physicians sometimes can be confused about it. And then we want to say that uh, hepatitis B is a very heterogeneous or diverse disease. So it's not like a, a very predictable way that the disease will progress. One person is very different from another. So we want to see what's the natural history and how disease progress over time. And then treatment, okay, good treatments available, but not everybody needs to be treated. So who, why, and when should we treat patients with hepatitis B? And what are the treatment options, okay? What is it like to be on treatment for hepatitis B? And then it's very important because this is an area of my interest. Liver cancer is very important for us to be aware that if you have hepatitis B, you need to be screened for liver cancer. The idea of screening for liver cancer is that you make the diagnosis of liver cancer at an early stage so we can cure it as opposed to when, when liver cancer develop at a very advanced late stage, the, the fewer and fewer options that we can offer patients like that. So these are the, the main topics that I'm going to cover today. So globally, hepatitis B is still a very important health care problem. Uh, it's estimated that about 250 million people worldwide are infected with hepatitis B. And then you, you, you know, for you, um, all you who are familiar with geography, the color in red means that the prevalence is highest, like in China, Southeast Asia, Sub-Sahara Africa, some parts of South America. And the prevalence you know, for many, many decades has been estimated to be at least 8% in those areas. So we think that the number may be slightly lower uh, more recently because of the implement implementation of vaccination program, but we don't know exactly how low it has become. So hopefully we're going to see these numbers decrease over time, but it may take a long time for us to see that we can actually eliminate hepatitis B through the vaccination program. The vaccination program in many countries started in the 80s, so people who were born you know, before the 1980s and in the U.S. before 1991, they're clearly at risk for developing hepatitis B. So we still have a big population who's infected with hepatitis B that we have to take care of. So in the U.S., we don't consider ourselves to be an area where hepatitis B is endemic. However, you know, when we look at the population being infected, majority of them are immigrants from areas that are a very high prevalence of hepatitis B. So, you know, this is the Asian Health Mini Medical School. So what we are looking at is that all Asians and Pacific Islanders you know, should be screened for hepatitis B. We should screen all Asians for hepatitis B. The prevalence is as high as 8% that we talk about. They account for 90% of all the hepatitis B infected individuals in the U.S. And Asians born in the U.S should also be screened as many of them were born, as I mentioned, before universal vaccination of all the newborns that was implemented by the CDC in 1991. So you do your math, if somebody is, so 1991, that means, you know, under the age of 30, okay, 28, 29, so if you're older than that, you know, you may not have been vaccinated at birth. And even vaccination is 90, 95% protective, not 100%. So we also 
would like to screen immigrants from areas uh, where the prevalence of hepatitis B is kind of in the intermediate range, in the 2 to 7 percent range, and then all the household and sexual contact of hepatitis B infected individuals. And you know, for all the other groups, who else should we screen? Uh, history of IV drug use, multiple sexual partners, history of sexually transmitted disease, homosexually active men, inmates, individuals, is part of the evaluation for patients with abnormal liver enzymes, people who are infected with hepatitis C or HIV, we should screen for hepatitis B, and then individuals on hemodialysis, they're doing, you know, very frequent check for hepatitis B. Uh, and then, you know, all women who are pregnant, they routinely check for hepatitis B. Okay, so this is a, uh, is a required, uh, it's a mandate that all pregnant women need to be screened for hepatitis B. So it's not uncommon for me to receive referral from obstetrician or gynecologist because the mother is infected and, you know, we're not aware, and so that needs, uh, uh, you know, evaluation for the hepatitis B infection. So how is hepatitis B transmitted? Okay. So hepatitis B is transmitted through contact with body fluids, usually blood. Um, it's present in the blood and other body fluids like semen, vaginal fluids, saliva, breast milk. And transmission can take place by sexual intercourse, body piercing, tattoo, blood transfusion, extremely rare right now with the screening of all the blood products and also by um, contaminated needles. So among the Asians, majority of Asians acquire the infection at birth. So usually it's because of spreading from infected mother to the baby at the time of birth. We call it vertical transmission. It's neonatal period. You know, the, the, at the birth, at birth they got the hepatitis B infection. So that's something important to think about. And why is this important? Okay. So when a baby acquired the infection, uh, the immune system is not mature enough to fight it. So when the baby acquired the hepatitis B infection, 90% of them become chronically infected. The immune system just doesn't allow them to fight it off. If this is an adult person who acquired the infection, you know, and then 95% of the time they fight off, so they become immune, they don't become chronically infected because the immune system allowed them to fight it off, okay? So this is very important. That's why, you know, in, you know, among the, you know, Asians when they acquire from infection, the infection at birth, majority of them become chronically infected, whereas in adult, 95% would clear the infection. It has something to do with the immunity, the immune maturity, at the time of infection. So let's talk about what happened to patients when they get the hepatitis B. So acute infection means that, okay, you got exposed and now you have acute hepatitis. Okay. And just keep in mind that, you know, while some patients, they can be sick, you know, jaundice, like ye yellow discoloration, or nausea, abdominal pain, fatigue, not feeling well. Sometimes the acute infection can be totally silent or asymptomatic. Okay. And uh, sometimes, you know, the only way to tell is because of the blood test. And the symptoms, you know, as I mentioned, body ache, loss of appetite. You know, the urine can turn dark, the stool can turn very light. The eyes can turn yellow or jaundice, fever, nausea. Those are some of the symptoms of acute hepatitis. And after the acute infection, as I mentioned, some clear the hepatitis and then become immune, so they are protected. And then others develop chronic hepatitis. Okay? So that's the, the principle behind why people develop hepatitis B. So a take-home message here is that hepatitis B may be a silent disease, okay? So I always really try to emphasize, okay? Don't go by how you feel, you know? Like if you don't feel sick, doesn't mean that you, you, you don't need to be checked, you don't need to be treated. So this is one of the, the, the most important misconceptions. People think that I feel fine, doctor. I don't need medication. I don't need to see the doctor. 
you know, this can be a silent disease, so it's a very important take-home message that don't go by symptoms before you check with the doctors, okay, in any situation. So this is the only Chinese word I'm putting in. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so what do we do as physicians taking care of patients who come in with hepatitis B? We check the liver test. Okay, so first, keep in mind that how do we uh, interpret what kind of test we do? So uh, we look at liver enzymes, ALT or SGPT, or AST and SGOT. So these are, you know, enzymes that are made by the liver. If the liver is injured, these enzymes leak into the blood so the level become elevated, okay? So these are called markers of liver injury or inflammation. And then there's also this, uh, um, you know, what we assess as liver function. Liver function is not always the liver test. Liver function means that, well, whether somebody has liver failure or not. So when the liver function tests are abnormal, like the bilirubin, you know, which is a reflection of the yellowness in the skin or eye, we call jaundice, you know, that person, you know, can have, basically has liver dysfunction. Or if the clotting factor we call prothrombin time INR is elevated, you know, that means that the liver is not carrying out the normal routine activities. So uh, the, the products like the protein, albumin, or clotting factor is not being produced properly, then they have signs of liver failure, or at least liver dysfunction in acute hepatitis or in patients with cirrhosis. So th those are some of the distinction we need to make. So for somebody who has early or you know, during the progression, during the natural history of hepatitis B, you know, they don't go into liver failure right away. There are exceptions to that, but it's generally a slowly progressive disease. The speed that uh, progression can be very variable from one person to another. So initially, they just have inflammation. And as inflammation occurs over time, uh, the, in, in, the injured cell become replaced by scar tissue. So, so you want to stop that process with treatment. Otherwise, the scar tissue eventually, you know, pe people develop cirrhosis. So these are the, the, the initial tests that you need to be thinking about. And then the hepatitis B test. You know, I, uh, this is uh, something that we just have to do a lot in order to be familiar. So it, physicians sometimes can get confused, so it's very important for both physicians and patients to really understand what exactly are we testing and what are these tests all about and what do they mean. Okay. So this is really important. So the first test that I would order if I want to find out if a patient has hepatitis B, this is the test, okay? We call it hepatitis B service antigen, okay? This is the test, so I remember every year, every you know, few months, I would quiz the uh, trainees, and then it is very easy to get this wrong because you know, very often we don't spend enough time teaching all the students about how to interpret hepatitis B serology. So this is very important. So what defined that you have infection is the positive hepatitis B service antigen. That means infection. The other test that uh, we often check is the hepatitis B core antibody. That is a sign of exposure when we talk about IgG or the total. And then the hepatitis B service antibody, which reflects immunity. Somebody is now protected, has antibody to it, would not get it anymore if the titer is high enough. So this is a reflection of immune response to hepatitis B. It can be because of previous infection and spontaneous clearance or because of vaccination. And I'll tell you the difference with all these uh, tests. And then if a patient, you know, have the test with hepatitis B service antigen being positive, then you know that this patient is infected. Then you do additional tests, you know, markers of viral replication, the hepatitis B E antigen or envelope antigen, and also hepatitis B DNA. And then you want to do not just find out if it's positive or negative, but to look at the level, we call it the quantitative hepatitis B DNA. That is really important in terms of looking at both your liver enzymes and also the hepatitis B 
DNA or viral activity to decide on whether the patient needs to be on antiviral or medication to treat the hepatitis B. Okay? And I'll keep coming back to this. Okay? Okay, so, you know, the next couple of slides, these are the only complicated slide I'm going to show, okay? The, you know, so, but I, I'd like you to kind of imagine what exactly happened to, <clears throat> say, this first patient develop acute hepatitis B, but then spontaneously recover and clear the hepatitis B. So during the period when the person has hepatitis, you know, this uh, period from exposure to actually developing acute hepatitis can range from 40 to 160 days. So in this period, now the hepatitis B surface antigen become detectable in the blood. Now, if this patient clear the hepatitis B on his own, you know, this will disappear over time, okay? Over time, this will, you know, be undetectable. And then in this, you know, shortly after this, the hepatitis B core antibody will develop. There's also the IgM and then the total. So the, uh, the IgG will stay with this patient for a long time. And then a little bit time later, they would develop, this patient would develop what we call the hepatitis B service antibody. Okay, so imagine that this patient has cleared the infection many years ago, and now you're testing this patient for all these tests. So the service antigen will be negative, and then the service antibody will be detectable now here, and then the core antibody will also be detectable. So this is basically reflecting that this patient now has antibody, now has immunity because of previous infection. Now this person should not be confused as somebody who has active ongoing infection. That's a common mistake we see in practice, okay? That somebody is being, you know, referred to me because of you know, uh, because of uh, blood tests like this, and turn out that, you know, you're doing fine, you don't have infection, and actually you are immune to it, okay? So, so that's, a, you know, really important that we as physicians need to know what tests to order and how to interpret and how to educate patients, and you need to know about all these tests, what they mean, okay? Now, this is a different story, okay? If you have a patient who, um, let's say, get, you know, develop acute hepatitis B and then become chronically infected. So this, the virus is staying with this patient. This patient become chronically infected. This is what you see. The service antigen will stay detectable, you know, for a long time, okay? And then you, also, you see the same with the hepatitis B core antibody, and then you never develop the hepatitis B service antibody, okay? So this patient is now chronically infected, okay? So, so you throw all these three tests, okay? And then you can interpret what's going on. So in somebody who's chronically infected with hepatitis B, then you will see service antigen being positive, okay? So you, you get that. And then the core antibody total is positive and then no antibody. Now if this patient, you know, had hepatitis B infection, spontaneously cleared it, and now developed immunity from previous exposure, then the service antigen is negative, core antibody is positive, and then you have the service antibody. This patient become immune from previous infection or exposure. And then we as healthcare workers, we are required to, do, to, to, to take vaccine, you know, at a very early, you know, age, you know, because of, you know, like protect us from, you know, acquiring the infection. And then all the, you know, now all the newborns are getting hepatitis B vaccine. So this is what the blood test will look like. You know, the, the service antigen is negative, the core antibody is negative, and the only thing you see is the service antibody, okay? This is from vaccination, immunity from vaccination. Any question? Now, could it, if there's no service antibody, that they do not have immunity 
protecting them. Yes. Should this type of individuals, where well, I was born, does it exist? And if it does, should they be vaccinated? Uh, excellent question. So what if you have a situation, so I want to repeat the question. If um, this person previously exposed or infected and included the infection, and then, you know, so the core antibody will be positive, but now you don't see the antibody, so what does that mean? Okay. This is an excellent question. In the past, sometimes this test can be falsely positive, but now is basically usually the situation is that they develop immunity, but then over time the antibody titer will just kind of drop off. You know, we think that those patients are still protected. Okay, they still have some immunity. And then, you know, there's been a lot of discussions about should we just give them more vaccination? And now the data suggests that you don't need to. And they, you know, even if you give them vaccination, uh, they usually don't respond for whatever reason. So now this is a very important situation because the previous exposure, if you give a person like this, whether you have the antibody or not, if you give a person like this immune suppression, you can actually have a small chance of reactivation. So the hepatitis B can be like a serious, you know, a problem if you suppress the immune system like chemotherapy or biologics or transplants, some of those patients can have reactivation and develop a flare of hepatitis B. So that's something to keep in mind, okay. Uh, question there? Yes. If that is the case, um, is it possible for a person who is of carrier status for many, many years suddenly become non-carrier status rather than full-blown status? Yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, relates to the term carrier. Bear with me. I will spend some time kind of dispelling the misconception and mislabeling. I don't like to use the term carrier, because the carrier imply that, oh, you just carry the virus, it's not very serious. The term is overused, is often used incorrectly. So I'll tell you the distinction be between inactive carrier versus active disease. Those are the terms that we should, you know, use instead of the, the old term, oh, you're a carrier. Okay, that's very confusing. We like to not use the term carrier unless you specify somebody who has inactive disease and we call it inactive carrier. So the carrier term is extremely confusing to patients. So I like to throw that away and then somebody has chronic hepatitis B, don't say you are a carrier. That's often what happens. So telling somebody you're a carrier kind of, to me, sometimes give them the impression that you're doing okay. You're gonna just carry the virus, not doing anything. So th there's a distinction between inactive carrier state versus somebody who has active chronic hepatitis B. Okay. So we'll go, you know, bear with me, we'll show you some slides about that. Okay. So these are all excellent questions, so, uh, so I'm glad that uh, it's brought up. Um, so now that this, pa this person has chronic hepatitis B, you're doing markers that include E antigen, and also DNA and kind, kind of try to define what exactly is going on with this patient. So timing is great. The next slide tells you about what I'm talking about. So for chronic hepatitis B, you're basically dealing with three different groups. The first group, you know, I think we should be very specific. We call it inactive carriers. Now, this imply that this patient has very, very low level of viral activity. Uh, when you check the DNA, is often undetectable or detectable at very, very low levels. Generally under a thousand. You know, sometimes you know two digits, sometimes three digits, but almost never over a thousand. Okay? And then when you look at the liver enzyme, the ALT is every single time is normal. So that means that this particular group of individual with hepatitis B is very inactive, okay? So inactive carrier, so generally they do very well, okay? They generally don't need antiviral therapy, okay? So this is the first group. 
we estimate maybe about one out of three fall into that group. Okay? So if somebody is like a very active, high viral low, ALT being abnormal, they cannot be called carrier. So the carrier term is overused and often uh, inaccurate. So I use the term inactive carrier. So this may be about 20, 30 percent of patients, they belong to that group. And then there's one group that, you know, the second group, the E antigen is positive. They have variable levels of hepatitis B DNA, the viral uh, replication. And then the ALT can be high or low. So when you look at the natural history of somebody who acquired hepatitis B at birth, they usually start being in this particular category. Some of them, they lose the E antigen, become inactive carrier. Some of them, they would move on to, you know, to mutate and become this category. And then, you know, the, the other remaining group, you know, the remaining um, portion of patients, they would have a period where, you know, the, the DNA is sky high in the billions, but yet the ALT is normal. We call it immune tolerant. That means that you go through a period when the virus is replicating, but the immune system doesn't really act upon it. So there's viral replication but very little injury to the liver. We call it immune tolerant. This is this group of patients. And then at some point, usually in their 20s or 30s, it varies from one person to another, then the disease becomes very, very active. That's the point that injury happens to the liver, the ALT starts to go up. Those are the patients that need therapy. So, you know, this, um, you know, we want to just slow down here a little bit because it can be confusing. So just think about this, three groups. One, inactive carrier. Another group, very active, E antigen positive. Another group, E antigen negative. And they have various degree of viral activity or AL, ALT level. So they're basically, we're dealing with three different groups. Not everybody needs to be on treatment. I'll talk more about that. So hepatitis B is a very dynamic disease. So you can see that you have, you may start off here in some patients spontaneously clear or one of the particles called E antigen and then they become inactive. Okay, so they generally do very well. And then in this particular group, there's a subgroup, you know, particularly the young ones, they, we call it you know, immune tolerant, the viral count is like sky high in the billions, but then the ALT is cold normal. So they generally do okay, and then later on, then the immune system can be active and then attack the virus that's infecting the liver cells. The liver start getting injured, and that's the time when you can see disease progression, and that's the time you have to intervene with therapy. And then there's also mutation, you know, from the, the, the E antigen positive patients to E antigen negative, and they still have <clears throat> the viral replication and disease progression in this particular uh, group of patients. As I mentioned already, like, you know, even if somebody who's inactive at this point, if this person is exposed to chemotherapy or other agents, biologics for inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis, suppress the immune system, they can actually have a flare, okay, or becoming very active. So we have to be very careful whenever anybody is getting chemotherapy or, you know, biologics, they need to check the hepatitis B status before they start these medications. So it's very important to understand that. So hepatitis B is a very dynamic disease. So it's a natural history that we, we want to pay attention to. So you have acute hepatitis. As I mentioned, there are a lot of patients when they develop acute hepatitis, they become chronically infected, especially if they acquired it from mother to child or vertical transmission. And then for patients with chronic hepatitis B, they can have different pathways. One group, they have very inactive disease. They generally don't require therapy and they generally have very good prognosis, but they still have a small risk for developing liver cancer. And then the other group, they have progressive disease. They can have ongoing liver injury, and then ongoing liver injury, a lot of these patients can develop cirrhosis, okay? Cirrhosis means scarring the liver. At some point, uh, the scarring and the cirrhosis, patients can develop signs of liver failure, Patients with cirrhosis, they also have much higher risk 
for developing liver cancer. So that's why in this particular group of patients, we identify these patients and then try to intervene and then try to stop the progression of the disease with antiviral therapy. Okay. So what are the recommended treatment endpoints? Okay. Um, for patients who are E antigen positive, you know, one endpoint that has been discussed is to lose the E antigen and become E antibody positive. Okay. And then you need the E antibody to stay positive for at least six months to a year before you would stop therapy. So traditionally, that has been looked at as an endpoint, but then later on we find out that, you know, relapse, you know, like, you know, even achieving that, a lot of patients after you stop therapy, you know, the, the, the E antigen become positive again, so relapse happened. So we failed in a lot of cases in stopping therapy. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the currently available therapy, they're very good, very easy to tolerate, but then they are not finite, okay? They generally need to be continued long-term for the majority of patients who require therapy, okay? So the currently available hepatitis B treatment are primarily suppressive. They can really do well, they can, they can control the disease, patients do very well, but it's not like something we can stop after a short period of time. Majority of them need to be on therapy long term. And that's clearly the case with E antigen negative patients. We don't really have an endpoint. You know, most of us would just continue therapy long term. The one exception is that the very, very small percentage of patients who can clear the service antigen. You remember what I talked about the service antigen? That's the marker infection. And sometimes, you know, maybe 1%, 2% a year you can see clearance of the service antigen. And those patients, you can stop therapy and they do very well. Okay. So that's the really the best endpoint, but it's very difficult to achieve. Okay. So who should we consider therapy? So I'm going to keep going back to this multiple, multiple times. You know, so you look at two things. <clears throat> One is the ALT level, the liver enzyme. The other one is the hepatitis B DNA. Okay. Always look at both. Don't just not look at one and not the other. The two has to be looked at together to make a decision about whether the person needs to be on therapy. And I'll give you some case examples, okay, just to refresh your memory. So according to the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease Guideline, ASLD Guideline, okay, um, for patients who are E antigen positive, we generally recommend treatment if the ALT is at least two times upper limb than normal. Now, what is normal is a, a subject of some discussions over the years. So the latest guideline says ALT of 35 for male and 25 for female. You know, that used to be 30 for male and 19 for female. So Roughly, if somebody's ALT is in the 50, 60 range, you have to consider therapy in conjunction with a DNA level that is at least 20,000 if that person is E antigen positive. Okay. And in patients who are E antigen negative, so abnormal ALT with lower threshold in the DNA of only 2,000. To simplify things, this is what I do in practice. If you look at the laboratory value for that particular test, whether it's at Quest or LabCorp or UCSF, if it's above the upper limit, which can be in the 50s or 60s, if it's above that upper limit normal, that's kind of an indication that you need to be considered for therapy if the DNA is above those thresholds that we talked about. 2,000 for E energy negative patients, or 20,000 for E engine positive patients. So that's how we kind of make our decision looking at both the ALT and also the DNA. That's how we do and how, how we counsel patients about whether they need to be on therapy. <clears throat> Just for your interest, there are different subtypes uh, called genotype 
hepatitis B. So now we have A to J, okay? So there are 10 different subtypes, um, mostly because of variation in where, you know, so for instance, uh, genotype A is primarily in Europe, uh, whereas B and C primarily in Asia, D, you know, Africa, and then in, um, I think in India, you see some genotype D, and then, you know, various different variation in geographic location, you know, predominance of genotype. So in practice, we don't use the hepatitis B genotype to make treatment or management decisions. So it's more like for, for your information, we don't really use the genotype to make decision about, oh, whether this person need to be on therapy or not. It's just that they're different subtypes. So in case you hear that, oh, you have genotype C, maybe there's a greater chance of, you know, cirrhosis or liver cancer, you know, like we don't really use the genotype information to make treatment recommendations or change how we manage patients, okay? Just for your information. So, you know, what are the available therapy, you know, that uh, we use for treating hepatitis B? So we have gone through changes over the last two decades. So, you know, these are oral nucleoside nucleotide analogs, okay? So these are, you know, uh, very easy to take. They are once a day pill. And uh, we know that the, they generally are for long-term therapy is very difficult to just treat patients for a short period of time. So they need to be on therapy for a long period of time. So the first generation is lamivudine, okay? And that is, you know, it, the other name for that is epivir. So lamivudine, the, the problem with that is that that's the first licensed uh, oral medication for hepatitis B. One of the problems is that, you know, resistance develop at a very high rate. That means that after uh, a while, say in the first year, after taking this medication, uh, the virus can mutate, and so the medication is no longer effective. And the rate is very high, like 20% per year. Okay? So this is no longer you know, being the first line therapy. We generally try to avoid it. And then the second line, adefovir and telbuvidine. Uh, adefovir, um, it's a lower rate of resistance, but it's still pretty high, you know, about 25% at four years, and the potency is not great. So the second generation drugs have similar problem, even though it's a slight improvement over lamivudine. Uh, and tegavir uh, and tenofovir are basically the third generation antivirals, they are now considered to be the first-line therapy. And Tegavir, very low resistance rate. We're talking about 1% after five, six years. Uh, one of the problems is that if somebody develops resistance to lamivudine, and then if you give this person Antegavir, the resistance rate is much, much higher. Okay? So Antegavir is not an ideal drug for somebody who has been exposed or developed resistance to lamivudine. Uh, tenavovir, uh, one of the, um, uh, the main findings is that we have not detected any resistance to tenavovir. Um, the first tenavovir prodrug that came out had a, you know, the one to 3% chance of developing kidney toxicity. Now with the newer prodrug, uh, Vimidi or tenavovir elefenamide, the risk of developing kidney toxicity is expected to be much lower. Okay, so we have, you know, high, you know, like better prodrugs over time. So clearly, entegavir and tenavovir are currently the first line therapy for hepatitis B. Again, I want to emphasize that, you know, these medications are very easy to take. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of side effects, but require long-term therapy. Okay, so uh, sometimes I. You know, talk to the patient. Patients always ask me, you know, I'm taking this medication now for a long time. You know, like, you know, should I stop it? You know, be very, very careful about stopping because we see flares of hepatitis B immediately after stopping therapy, particularly patients who had 
more advanced disease. You know, prior to developing therapy like cirrhotic patients, you should never stop therapy because the flare patients can develop liver failure. So very important that, you know, think about, you know, you know, there are always questions about should I start therapy once I start therapy? You know, like I mean, I need to take medicine for a long time. You think about high blood pressure. When you take medication for high blood pressure, you don't expect to stop it after six months. So it's the same principle. You can really protect your liver if you take this over a long period of time and then not think about just stopping it. We don't have finite therapy or cure yet at this point. Uh, the other alternative is not a very good option is interferon. Uh, interferon has lots of side effects. So some patient with genotype A, they may have a better response to uh, interferon, but you know, the treatment is for a year, the response rate is not very good. It's only in the 20, 30 percent range, and the side effects are really substantial. Okay? So we use less and less interferon now, at least in the West. So to, you know, a lot of information I just throw at you, so maybe just try to just refresh your memory and just look at these case scenarios, and then you can tell me what you would like to do, okay? So the first case, uh, Mr. C is a 56-year-old man with chronic hepatitis B, negative hepatitis B, e-antigen on prior testing. So, you know, you... You know, you look at this patient and look at the record. You have three different sets of blood tests, say, six months apart. So the ALT range from, you know, like it's up and down, okay? One time is 84, another time is 32, now it's 100. The DNA is also like up and down, okay? 150,000 here, 400, and then now it's up and down. So you know, just keep in mind that, you know, the fluctuations in the liver test and the DNA is really not uncommon. Okay? So let me ask you this. So how many of you would say this patient should be on treatment? Okay. Okay. So how many would say this patient doesn't need to be on therapy? So what about the rest? <laughs> okay, so at least more, so more people say this patient needs to be on therapy, right? Okay, so the principle here, you look at two things. You look at the ALT, you look at the DNA, the virus, okay? So you need both of them to be, you know, kind of high to, to, to say, okay, there's no question, you know, this needs to be on therapy, this patient needs to be on therapy. So the ALT here, you know, you don't need, you know, like, you know, all three of them to be elevated. If you see this pattern up and down, but then they, they get to be abnormal. Every time it's abnormal, you're talking about some injury. And then when you have the viral count that's being high, there's no question this patient should be on antiviral therapy. So you're right. Okay. This patient has active disease, you should treat. And the, the, the you look at the, the level, the E antigen negative patients, the recommended level is above 2,000, okay? And then the ALT above the upper limb normal, and then upper limb normal, this patient meet the criteria, okay? Now, <clears throat> this patient believed that his wife and his children have all received vaccination, but wants to make sure that they are now immune. Does, does this sound familiar to you, okay? So uh, he wants to know what test should you request from the doctor, okay? So you check surface antigen to, to make sure that this person, this, you, know, the, you know, the family is not infected. You want to check the surface antibody to make sure it's immune. And then probably a good idea to check the hepatitis B core antibody just to have a more complete picture. So it's just using the same slide that I show you. So we want to make sure that the family member is not infected. So, so you don't want to see this. You don't want to see the service antigen being positive. So if this person is vaccinated, okay, so you should see blood tests like this. The service antigen is negative, and then the service antibody is positive. The core should be negative. Okay, so if you see the service antibody being positive, that means that, well, you're protected. But one other thing. You know, you want to look at the, you know, because it's not routine that, that they give you a quantitative titer. If the titer is at least 10, you're immune for life, if you have documentation of that. So the 10 is the magic number, okay? 
if somebody, you know, you have, don't have information from years ago that the level was high, but then it slowly come down to less than 10. So it may, may mean that the patient has lifelong protection, but you just don't know because now you don't have the record from years ago. Uh, so 10 is the kind of the magic that if you re reach the level of 10 for the antibody, this person is, should be immune and protected. Okay. So, so this, this is a kind of a practical situation that um, patients always ask. Okay, question? Um, so let's say the child was vaccinated and then started off with the antibody level of, let's say, 500. And then over the course of 10 years, it falls to below 10. Um, yeah. So, the, uh, excellent question. So the question is, if you have protective titers, say very high titer, and then over time is much, much less. The CDC recommend no need for a booster. The CDC does not, okay, because once you reach that 10, uh, so you have lifelong immunity. Okay? So even if the light titer for that below the, the, the 10 threshold. Okay. So the CDC does not recommend. Now, if I see somebody who's really at risk, you know, like a healthcare worker, you know, I generally say, well, even though this is not CDC, I generally say, no, it's probably a good idea to, to get a booster. Okay. But then technically speaking, you don't need it. This person is protected. Okay, okay. good question. Another case. So different situation. So Ms. L is a 46-year-old woman, chronic hepatitis B, negative E antigen on prior testing. The reason I keep using E antigen is because this is the majority of who, you know, the, the situation I see. So majority of patients with chronic hepatitis B, they have E antigen e engine negative now when they come to see me. So it's a predominant, is, is really the more common group. So now you look at the ALT and DNA. So uh, the first set, the ALT is 18, DNA is 100, and then it falls to under 10. That's great. And then this time it's 40, and then the ALT is like 18 to 20 range. Okay. How many of you would like to treat this this individual? Zero. Okay. So how many of you will just observe and watch? Okay. Yeah. So it sounds good. So how do you, what do you call this person? Inactive carrier, okay. So sometimes they can fool you, but you follow them long enough, you, you basically see that every single time you're seeing this kind of pattern. So all you need to do is to monitor them. How often do you monitor them? Uh, three to six months, okay. So I generally use six months. You follow them long enough, and then every time you see the same thing, you feel very reassured. If you don't treat somebody, you know, then you may want to do other tests to assess the, you know, the, the level of scarring and things like that. We'll talk more about that. Okay. Question. It's not confusing. I thought viruses only have RNA. This DNA is one of the very few DNA because the DNA that makes hepatitis B unique because it can integrate into the human genome, and that's the reason why it's so difficult for us to cure hepatitis B because it integrates into the so, genome. And to follow that up, the next question is that, so our blood uh, is regenerates, right? Every few weeks, <laughs> it's like the, the old blood you know, dies and then the new blood gets generated by the bone marrow. When the hep B DNA stays at even at 40, you know, does it mean that there's still the happy virus inside the body sure. that sure. keeps mm -hmm. generating this DNA? So it's like well, you know, uh, carriers, inactive status, but it's not so inactive. Yeah, so, you know, is is you know, like, you know, the, the very low level of DNA basically just the, the reflecting the fact that you know, hepatitis B is not just in the liver, it can be anywhere. If the viral activity is so low, it's generally not doing anything, you know. Uh, so, you know, you don't have much injury going on, so uh, it, it's relative, okay. So it's detectable, but it's, you know, this, we're talking about a situation where the virus is not very active. 
So it's all measuring is there. So this person is not like, you know, still has hepatitis B, you know, but the activity is low. Uh, patient generally do very well because there's not much injury to the liver. As I mentioned, that the situations where there's chemotherapy or biologics or immunosuppression, uh, the, the virus can become much more active under the situation. So, and then, you know, a small percentage of patients may still develop cancer. Okay? So this is not like somebody you can just ignore. You still have to follow them with blood tests and still continue to have screening for cancer. So, uh, so it's just that these are the patients who don't need uh, antiviral therapy, but they still need to be monitored. Or a patient with hepatitis B it needs indefinite monitoring. Is there any drop to serums? It can, but then, you know, it can be inactive. You know, like undetectable, it can be so inactive that it's undetectable every time. Occasionally you can see that, but it's no different than somebody who has had, you know, low levels of viremia. Okay. So, Everybody agree. So this is inactive carrier, no treatment needed, but continue monitoring. Um, so if uh, do it every six months, I think is the minimum that you should follow these patients. But if you establish that you know this patient really has you know years of having no change, then every six months is good, is adequate. In the beginning, if I just get to know the patient, I may check it more often. Okay. So, you know, the third case, Mr. W is a 66-year-old man with chronic hepatitis B, and negative hepatitis B E antigen on prior testing. So the ALT is normal every time, 18, 20, and 19. DNA is higher. So 2,500, 76, you know, 98, 100. So um, to treat or not to treat? How many of you say treat? Okay. How many of you say just watch? Okay. Like we split, right? So borderline cases. Okay. So I'm seeing more and more of patients like this. Okay. So borderline cases, what do you do? Okay. So uh, in the past, one strategy is do a liver biopsy, and then find out if you know there's much scarring or activity because sometimes there's a not perfect correlation between the ALT and what you see on the biopsy. Now, very often when I ask for patients to come back for a biopsy, I never see them again <laughs> because it's like an invasive procedure. And uh, so, you know, uh, you have to respect the fact that, you know, uh, you know, these invasive procedures, if the information you gain is so little to change the management, you, you really have to you know, like talk to the patient about the risk and the benefits. So uh, what we do now is that we have other non-invasive ways to assess the degree of scarring. So this is a fibro scan. We have this in our clinic, um, and it's cheap. Um, I almost never get denial from the insurance. Um, and so give us very good information. So fibros can basically take advantage of what we call shear wave velocity, you know, technology to, you know, kind of estimate how stiff the liver is. So the more scarred the liver is, like cirrhotic, the stiffer it is. So you get different readings and you, you do a calibration and say if you have this velocity, then this, this degree of fibrosis. So people do enough of these tests, you know, study this long enough, they'll come up with the, the, the kind of a pretty accurate assessment of the degree of scarring. So if I have uh, a patient who is the borderline cases, I check a fibro scan. If, you know, this is non-invasive, it takes only 10 minutes, and it's nearly as good as liver biopsy, we don't necessarily need everything, we just need to know what's the, the estimated stage of scarring or fibrosis. We have that information to really help guide treatment decisions. So if a patient like this, you get a fibro scan, and the fibro scan set is the lowest stage, zero to one. You know, the stage would be like zero to four. Uh, the lowest stage, you can potentially just, okay, so this is reassuring, so we can just watch you, not treat. 
and then repeat this in two to three years and then see if there's any progression. So it's a very useful way to monitor patients who are not on antiviral therapy. Okay? So in fact, that's what happened. You have this patient, the fibro scan is done, and this is the lowest stage. You can't really separate zero to one, so that's the best we can do. Zero to one, that's the lowest stage, whereas stage four is the highest stage, which basically means cirrhosis, scarring. So if you have stage zero to one, you can just watch the patient and follow the blood test every three to six months. And then if they, over time, the DNA is high, and the ALT goes up, then you still should initiate antiviral therapy. But this is the borderline group that I see quite often. ALT is always normal, so at any time, if the ALT becomes abnormal, the viral test is high, then you should start antiviral therapy. So this is a very useful tool. Question? Is the ALT, do you find the ALT does usually rise over time? Yes, I do. Uh, so the question is, do these patients over time need, you know, like can develop ALT and, you know, so I think majority of them at some point need to be on therapy in my experience, but I think it's still reasonable for us to hold off because we don't need to start therapy when they don't have to. If you have the fibro scan suggesting that it's still very, very early, so you don't have to start patient on therapy if you don't. Um, if you don't have enough evidence that that would make a difference. But at some point, you know, I've had patients that follow for over 10 years and then, and then after that they develop the increase in ALT or it can happen within a shorter period of time. Very variable, okay. So, so this makes sense to everybody, like how we do it. Um, so you can have like obvious cases, but then a lot of times they fall into this category where you can go either way. Now the fibro scan is one, you know, way of, you know, assessing this. We don't really do liver biopsy because it's, it's, it's invasive. But, you know, on the other hand, if you have other considerations, uh, if you need to find out if somebody has another disease process based on other blood tests, then biopsy is still useful. Now, in a situation like this, when it's borderline case. If a patient has, say, a family history of liver cancer, okay, uh, um, say mother or father or sibling, liver cancer, I'm leaning towards the side of treating these patients, okay, because you know, like, you know, like this is like a, a kind of like tiebreaker, okay. If you have a risk for developing cancer, I generally lean towards just treating it, protect this person. Okay. So. Now, Mr. W reports that he has been taking a magic liver pill that he bought three months ago, has been feeling better overall. And what, what do you think about you know, this? They feel better, not necessarily mean that you know, the pill is working. Uh, that's truly a placebo effect, that's real. I mean, you take something, you think that you is doing something, you feel better, so the placebo effect is real. And uh, so, so any of these um, that, that we don't, you know, sometimes they, 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 they give a whole bag of these, and, and I can't really tell them because there's no information. Uh, what, what's the risk, what's the benefit, we really don't know. So you're taking it at your own risk. But I have pretty good evidence talking to a lot of uh, my colleagues, you know, and also other uh, experts in Asia that some of these pills contain the mimidine. Some of these pills contain like the oldest antiviral. When they have lamivudine, that means that it will make your numbers look a little bit better. But you don't want to take those medications because you know it's a very high risk for resistance, and that will limit your choices of future therapy. So be very careful about uh, what you do for these herbs and supplements because we truly do not know the risk, and you know, so you're taking it at your own risk. And then the alcohol, what do you guys think? You know, like drink on average two glasses of wine or two cans of beer three to four times a week. You know, I don't have like, a, you know, really solid evidence that moderate alcohol use is bad for you, but I generally tell them not to drink, okay? 
you know, just because, you know, who knows, at one point maybe this individual can develop liver cancer and you need to be considered for transplant, you don't want the ongoing alcohol use while you're under the care of Dr. Yao. And then Dr. Yao told you not to, not to drink and then you're still drinking, you may delay the time to, you know, being listed for transplant. So some of the considerations. Uh, so I generally, you know, I don't have like clear, you know, high level evidence is bad for you, but I generally don't like, you know, alcohol in patients who have chronic liver disease. If they have cirrhosis, it's a no no. Any alcohol use will be terrible. Okay. So all these supplements out there and our <clears throat> our recommendation is don't do it. Okay. So I think that it's important for us to dispel some of the misconceptions. Remember do not go by how you feel. Liver disease can be silent for many years, and this applies to a lot of patients I take care of with hepatitis B and also liver cancer. Liver cancer patients, they sometimes they feel good. They don't want treatment, they don't want transplant, and then basically they lose the opportunity, and that's detrimental to them. And don't go by how you feel because, you know, like I think a lot of, you know, like uh, you have experience with hepatitis B, but we're talking about who doesn't know anything about hepatitis B, they never want to be tested, why am I getting tested if I feel good? That's a very, very bad misconception. So don't go by how you feel. Liver disease can be silent for many years. And uh, there's a lot of misconception about Tylenol. Tylenol is actually very safe. Uh, you can take it, it's not harmful to the liver. If you take a small dose, up to two grams, um, even for patients with cirrhosis, is actually safe. The only situation you should not take Tylenol is when you know, the individual is actually drinking a lot, alcohol. Alcohol lower the threshold of toxicity to Tylenol, so the, the combination alcohol and Tylenol can be very dangerous. But for those who are not drinking, Tylenol is actually very safe, up to two grams a day. Okay? So each uh, pill, extra strain is 500 milligrams, so up to four a day, one to two at a time. Question? When you say avoid alcohol, you mean zero, even Close to zero. Close to zero. So special occasions is what I would recommend, okay? other than special occasions. Okay. So the, the question is why do you know why do people back then use a combination of two drugs? Okay. So you know the evolution of antiviral therapy is that you know you start with lamivudine, okay, so it's not very good. Uh, so you have resistance. So the next generation um, is a little bit better. But we were taught, we were trained at that time, based on the experience with HIV, is to use combo. You don't switch from one to another because, you know, like combination therapy eliminate or minimize the risk of resistance. That's the principle that we went, well, we, 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 we were going, going by. And now that uh, we didn't expect that, you know, we can have medication, you know, like tenofovir that has zero resistance. We, we never imagined back then that we would see that. So now the combination therapy approach is no longer necessary. So when you have like zero resistance, we didn't really think that it would happen, but now we've been tested years after years and then really vigorously we don't find any resistance to the medication for Hep B, that's great. But uh, HIV is a different story, you cannot use you know, so always have to test for HIV for hepatitis B infected patients because you don't use a single drug for co-infected patients. They develop HIV resistance with the tenofovir. So you always have to do combo. So those are some of the things we learned. Okay, excellent question. So we don't use combination therapy. Now, um, you know, majority of patients, they, uh, one medication would do the job in achieving virologic suppression. There are exceptions that you need two drugs to get the virus suppressed to undetectable level, but that's uncommon. And avoid herbs and supplements, uh, avoid alcohol, so those are some of the key things. Okay, so 
Um, that's another really important take home message is don't forget about cancer screening, okay? I'm very passionate about this issue because, you know, uh, there are patients who like, you know, whether it's hepatitis C, hepatitis B, you know, they're doing great, and then I have C, they're cure, forget about screening, and then they come with incurable cancer. It is really uh, unfortunate. So, you know, my approach is that, you know, a patient with hepatitis B, every six months, I get them to do an ultrasound. I usually also go with alpha fetal protein as well as a tumor marker. I always screen patients who are at risk. Now, the guidelines here basically specify that these are the higher risk individuals who need to be um, undergoing screening for liver cancer. And patients with cirrhosis, that's very obvious, they are the highest risk group. Family history of liver cancer, you know, first degree relative, whether parent or sibling. And then, you know, uh, people are fixated on the age cutoff and then forgot about everything else. So age is like 50 for female and 40 for male. So those are the guidelines, but a lot of individuals remember this and forget about everything else. So, so this is only one of the, 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 the criteria. And then hepatitis D uh, is very uncommon in, you know, in the, the U.S. hepatitis B Asian population, but there's some subgroups like in Southeast Asia and Mongolia, the prevalence of hepatitis B is quite high. Okay. So I generally screen more liberally because screening ultrasound, I mean, they're not that expensive. But I don't like screen people who are really young and with inactive disease. The risk is very, very low. But but patients who are on therapy, who had enough of the viral activity, in addition to all these criteria, I generally like to do screening every six months. Okay. So every year is not enough for patients who are at risk for liver cancer. Okay. And uh, you know, the idea of screening is that you detect, now even these screening tests are not perfect, but at least you have a better chance of detecting you know, cancer at a very early stage so you can offer treatment that's cure, that's curative, as opposed to very advanced stage uh, cancer that very few good options that we can offer. So vaccination, uh, hopefully, you know, 57 years later, uh, will eliminate hepatitis B, but we still have to deal with a lot of patients who are currently infected. But this vaccination is really important. This program that started in Asia, say in Taiwan, they started this uh, in 1984. In the U.S., it's 1991. So you really eliminate the carrier rate the, the hepatitis B you know, infection rate to less than 1% after implementation of this vaccination program, and also much, much lower rate of cancer, liver cancer. And so now uh, everybody who's born um, to hepatitis B service antigen positive mothers, in addition to getting hepatitis B vaccine, they also get immunoglobulin. Okay? So give them the, the, the maximum protection. And if the mother has very, very high viral load, uh, say over 200,000, uh, now the new recommendation is that uh, in the third trimester, we put them on antiviral therapy like tenofovir uh, so that even lower the risk of transmitting the virus to the baby. Okay? So only those with very high viral load during the, so we give them the medication in the third trimester. And so to summarize, these are the take-home messages. Number one, all Asian Pacific Islanders should be screened for hepatitis B. This is the first and most important step. If people don't know that they have hepatitis B, we can't really help them. Okay. So uh, friends and relatives, if they have not been tested, they need to. Okay. And this is, a, you know, it's, it's always good to know you know, early on as opposed to waiting until it's, you know, something bad happens. So hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B, can be silent disease, do not go by how you feel. Uh, regular monitoring is essential. Understand the guidelines for treatment and based on liver enzymes, markers of liver injury and the DNA, but that's the marker of DNA, that's the marker of viral replication. So you look at both come in combination to decide on whether 
uh, treatment is indicated. And then, you know, with the advances in these oral antiviral therapies, they are potent, they are very safe, well tolerated, low risk for drug resistance, but, you know, it's long term therapy. It's not finite therapy or cure. And early treatment, if indicated, can prevent complications, liver disease due to cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer. Okay. Screening for liver cancer with ultrasound, alpha fetoprotein every six months in hepatitis B infected individuals is really also important. So you can diagnose liver cancer in an early curable stage. Okay. So thank you very much. Question. Uh, no, no. I, I had a typo. I'm so sorry about the last slide. There was this. Uh, I don't know where it came from. Um, so uh, I had a typo. No, no. They, they, you know. So we do routine, uh, routine, um, um, you know, health maintenance to check, you know, hepatitis A to see if they need vaccination. Okay. Uh, we check hepatitis C because co-infection we manage differently. And then D is we check in on everybody. So we do those health maintenance, you know, things. A question? Yeah, so we, uh, we want patients who are infected with hepatitis B to be careful with raw seafood because of this bacteria called Vibrio. Um, you know, the Vibrio infection in hepatitis B or other patient with chronic liver disease can be, you know, they can get sicker, okay. But, you know, like, um, you, know, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you can have hepatitis A from eating contaminated food, you can have, you know, generally hepatitis B is not transmitted by, you know, what we call oral, f you know, like by eating something, okay. So whereas hepatitis A is. So, you know, hepatitis A can be transmitted by eating, you know, whether it is, uh, Contaminated meat, or you know, or, you know, or seafood that's raw seafood, things like that. So, so that's a different situation. Uh, question again. Do you know if uh, there is any uh, experiment done to come up with a drug that will cure, not just treat, but cure hepatitis B? The way they come up with hepatitis B. Yeah, lots, lots of. Lots of research is going on. Um, I can't tell you anymore. Um, but, you know, also, oh, sorry, uh, the question is the efforts to find a cure for hepatitis B? Absolutely. It's difficult. It may take a long time, but lots of efforts are being put into it. It's not going to be easy. Question. Well, I'm not saying that is, you know, so the question is why is it more difficult? These are two very different viruses. And when you look back, you know, it's, uh, you know, hepatitis C took a long time to find the cure. Um, so viruses are not easy to find cure. Okay. Question. You also have to work in the public health. Maybe kind of take um, vaccine for hepatitis B and C. And then I never thought about it. But should I get tested for that to see whether I got it? So the question is, yeah, we, we, you know, like for a patient with, the question is about vaccination and testing. So um, if a patient has liver disease, whatever etiology, we generally recommend that they get vaccination against hepatitis A and B. We generally recommend that. So they need to be tested. So I would test this person for evidence of immunity or infection, so I'll do a more comprehensive, you know, testing so I know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, to if you have liver disease from other causes, then we test and see if you are immune. Then at the same time, we also know that you don't have hepatitis B, okay? So, so that would serve the purpose as well. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.